invitation to speak to you about Russian literature is my absurd love for it. Uh, and my love for Russian literature came about uh, completely by accident. For those of you who, uh, who aren't familiar with my strange name, Groskop, G-R-O-S-K-O-P, Russians will immediately recognise that this is not a Russian name. Uh, but as a child, I grew up with this name uh, in Somerset, in the southwest of England. And I was always asking my family, what is this name? Where do we come from? What, what does this mean, this strange name, Groskop? And my family would always say, it's no big deal, we're completely English. From an early age, I was really interested in languages, even though nobody in my family spoke any foreign languages. And when I eventually chanced upon a copy of Anna Karenina when I was about 13 in a charity shop, I opened this book and found it full of strange and unpronounceable names. And I thought, oh, maybe these are my people. <laughs> and I began this very slow and unconscious journey of beginning to believe that maybe I was Russian. So it was not only a personal connection that I wanted my name to mean something, to really be Russian. It was also that I found this extraordinary world in Anna Karenina that explained to me so much about life. And yet there seemed to me this incredible contradiction between the warmth and the passion that I felt in the novel and the reputation that the Russians have for being so difficult and so depressing. And I wanted to resolve this problem because for me these novels all make me feel so warm and happy and optimistic about life, even though the messages in them are on the surface extremely dark and depressing. For me, what's really interesting about Anna Karenina and why it teaches us something really important and positive about life, it's that Anna lives out the life that she was destined to live out, but she chooses it herself. So she chooses to go against what society expects, and because of this she has to be punished. However, I want to make the case that the reason Anna Karenina is such a compelling and beautiful novel is because Tolstoy himself falls in love with Anna. I don't think he meant to do this. I think he meant to hold her up as an example of a terrible person. But in reality, I think that she's far more like him than he'd like to admit. And it's always fascinated me that after he wrote this book, Tolstoy had a, a profound life crisis. Once he'd written Anna Karenina, he disowns that book and he disowns War and Peace and says that everything he's written up to this point is bourgeois nonsense. And I believe, it's purely my, my own personal theory, I've uh, no, no academic uh, evidence for this, but I believe it's because he fell in love with Anna and he couldn't, he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle the fact that he himself wanted to be like this woman who wanted to live for herself and choose her own destiny and be authentic. Uh, and for me, that solves the mystery of this book of why it should be so dark and depressing, but actually it's very uplifting. Zhivago has suffered from this very difficult reputation, thanks to Nabokov's comments and those of others, that it's quite a patchy novel, almost like a series of short stories that have been spliced together with all kinds of different coincidences to, to make the novel add up and come together. Uh, and for me, the lesson uh, from Zhivago is about fate. And it's the most Russian lesson of all, you know, surrender to your fate. Uh, face up to whatever life throws at you. And what I love about Zhivago is the extraordinary coincidences in it. And for me, this is a brilliant hallmark of Russian literature. We see it in Tolstoy a lot as well. This embracing of fate and the idea that it's completely normal for uh, Zhivago to go to Yuryatin, 700 miles from Moscow. And despite the fact that it's 700 miles from Moscow, of course he bumps into Lara. She just happens to be there. Uh, one of my favorite lessons, uh, because I have personal uh, resonance with this, uh, is from Turgenev, A Month in the Country. So in A Month in the Country, it's a play. Uh, there's this character, Rakitin, who goes to spend a month in the country with his best friends. And he's madly in love with his best friend's wife, of course. And she doesn't love him back. So it's a lesson about unrequited love. For me, his lesson is the best lesson in how to survive unrequited love. 
And the lesson is you can't, you have to walk away, and that's what Rakitin has to do in the end. Of course, the ultimate lesson is don't fall in love with your best friend's wife. Um, but that would be most of Russian literature uh, non-existent if that lesson was followed. Um, another of my favourite uh, lessons comes from Chekhov, and that is one of acceptance uh, in Three Sisters. So Three Sisters is the constant refrain of to Moscow, to Moscow, if only we could return to Moscow a place none of them have been for 10 years. And this goes on and on through the whole play until the final fourth act where it's never mentioned at all. And I love this about Chekhov, that he, he sees so clearly in, into uh, the human psyche, partly because of his ongoing work as a doctor. You know, he worked as a doctor his whole life, apart from the last few years of his life where he could only really practice medicine on himself and it made him very unhappy. But he sees brilliantly uh, in, into people's lives and how we behave. And he's so brilliant at parodying that. But I think this is a wonderful lesson of Chekhov is this um, non-judgmental understanding of the human condition that we always think someone else has got it better somewhere else. And if only we were in Moscow or I guess in Pushkin House, that's part of our message. If only we were in Moscow. <laughs> but we know it's not really true. And the comedy that comes out of Three Sisters is largely Chekhov showing to, trying to show through the secondary characters of actually they really have quite a nice life and they have quite nice friends and everything is working out quite well for them. Young people are really fascinated by this idea of Chekhov and saying, oh, it's just like social media, it's like Instagram, <laughs> because we're always wishing that we're somewhere else and we're always comparing ourselves to other people's lives. And I'm like, yeah, the answer is already in Chekhov. You just have to read that. And I did another podcast as well where somebody said to me, so this old guy, Tolstoy, um, haven't you got a bit in your book about how he was like trolled? He, he was trolled repeatedly uh, because everyone knew where he lived in Yasnaya Palyana. People would come and visit him constantly without any invitation, soliciting money, showing manuscripts of their terrible novels that they'd written that they wanted him to read. One particular occasion that uh, his wife writes about in her diaries, someone sent him a huge box containing a length of rope with the suggestion, why don't you go hang yourself? <laughs> Uh, and the young people now I was talking to about this would say, oh, it's just like Twitter. Ahmatova uh, gave one of the best lessons as well. Uh, and that for me is the lesson of bravery. Extraordinarily brave woman. Uh, the lesson in her work, I think, is really about how to be optimistic in the face of despair. You couldn't have had a more difficult life uh, than she did. Instead of her being tortured by the regime, everyone close to her uh, was tortured. So both of her husbands sent to the gulag, her son sent to the gulag. What I love about Ahmadinejad's work is that it always has this little tinge of hope inside it. Um, I focus in the book on Requiem and on what she writes in Requiem about the lives of those left behind um, by those who went to the camps and what it's like to go to the prison to ask for news constantly. Um, but everything that in our part of that always has like a tiny tinge of, of something colourful and lively, as well as all the darkness. So there's always a mention of a glass of champagne or uh, the three glasses of vodka that she, she liked to drink. Uh, or in her earlier work, always something about what she would have been wearing. She loved to wear um, a beautiful, a tight black skirt she mentions in one poem. Uh, and one of my favourite uh, stories about Ahmatova is uh, from the times when her and Mandelstam used to visit with each other. And Ahmatova is travelling uh, to visit Mandelstam by train and she arrives very late and he says, well you're like Anna Karenina, you've come from the 19th century. And he takes her back to, uh, to his flat uh, with his wife, Nadezhda. And they don't really have any food and they go and visit all of their neighbours to see who's got some food. And they managed to find, uh, for Ahmatova, who she was very, very skinny, she didn't eat very much, and they managed to find a boiled egg. So they put a tarpaulin over the cooker, because they don't have a kitchen table, and they put this boiled egg in the middle of it, and Ahmatova's getting ready to eat it. And then there's a knock on the door, and it's the KGB. And it's a few months before everything is about to fall apart for Mandelstam, because he's written this poem about Stalin, uh, which he told to quite a lot of people. Uh, including Pasternak, who said, I didn't hear this, and this poem is a death sentence. 
So it's around this time, there's a knock at the door and it's the KGB, and for several hours they turn the flat upside down, take things, rip up things, remove everything that they can. And then when they finally leave and everything goes quiet, Ahmadiba says, are you going to eat the egg or shall I? <laughs> and again, for me, this exemplifies these lessons that we get from the Russians of appalling, unimaginable darkness and anguish that many of us can't even imagine. You know, God forbid we could ever experience something like this in our lifetime. And it's extraordinary to think that this is all well within living memory. And yet, there's always a joke, there's always something funny, there's always a flash of glamour, there's always something to cling on to. And I think that, for me, has been the things that have really um, brought the, these works alive uh, for me. Uh, the ultimate lessons, though, of course, I think, come in War and Peace um, from Tolstoy. And it's very, very cleverly spelled out. It's, it's the heart of War and Peace, and it's the heart of a lot of Russian literature is summed up in this bit. Uh, it's a character called Platon Karataev, who only pops up once for these five pages. And he meets Pierre, uh, and it's while when the um, forces are in retreat, and Pierre's uh, being captured by the French, and then he's escaped, and he meets Platon Karataev. And Platon Karataev is a proper mujik peasant. He imparts several lessons to Pierre, which take on a profound significance in the context of Tolstoy's life. Kalataev's life lessons are simple. Be grateful for the relationship you have with your mother. Tolstoy's mother died when he was two. Make sure you enjoy family life. His father died when he was nine. Be sure to have children of your own. Tolstoy had 13, eight of whom survived infancy. If you have your own house or family estate, know that you are lucky. Tolstoy inherited the family estate at Piesna Kalyana in 1847 at the age of 19. <coughs> One of the most important lessons for me, and this is what Kalataev imparts and gives, actually physically gives to Pierre, put salt on your potatoes and enjoy them as if they are a special treat. Tolstoy became an obsessive vegetarian late in life. Kalataev adds, the great thing is to get on with other people. Tolstoy followed this advice only occasionally in my view. But we can't all follow our own advice, can we? <laughs> so whilst I'm talking in this book about lots of these lessons uh, from these wonderful works, I'm threading through it my own memories of life in Russia. I lived in Russia um, in the early 1990s. And a lot of this book is trying to reconcile at that time, and my obsession that I had at that time of becoming as Russian as possible. Uh, there was a time when I refused to speak to my parents in England on the phone for six months uh, because they were polluting my language acquisition. <laughs> so I was not only learning to speak fluent Russian, I was learning to speak fluent idiot uh, as well. That was a time when I was completely immersed in this idea of Groskop. Groskop! It has to be Russian. I have to be Russian. There's nothing Russians love to do more than tell you that everybody is, is secretly Russian, right? And that if they like you, they will say, you have a Russian soul. And so I began to believe this. And the more it went on, people would say, oh, Groskop, where is your name from? And I'd say, I don't know. And then they would find out that I'd lived in Russia, I worked for Russian Vogue, I speak Russian, I must be Russian. So I would never say to people, hello, I'm Russian, because I really clearly wasn't. But people sort of believed it and would say it, and it just became something that was always in the background. So I, I decided it was my thing, and that was going to be who I was. And I felt very happy that I discovered my roots and got one over my parents, who clearly did not understand the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when I was in my late 20s, so this had been going on for about 10 years, we were contacted by a long-lost relative. And he turned out to be a long-lost cousin, and he traced our entire family tree. And my grandfather looked at this list of names, and he confirmed all of it, and it all turned out to be true. And we're not Russian. We're from Poland. And if there's one country that hates Russia more than any <laughs> other, it is Poland, the country of my people. <laughs> so I learned the wrong language. I lived in the wrong country and I slept with the enemy <laughs> and I wanted to find a way to resolve this and 
just as I found myself as a teenager, I then went back through all this Russian literature to try and fix myself again and think, I was drawn to this for a reason, there has to be something here. And it was through reading it again as a, as a neutral person, as myself, rather than somebody with something missing, that I realised what's so special to me about all of these books. And it's because they've been part of my life and I've grown up with them. And all of the ideas and characters and stories that are contained in them, they matter as much to me as any truth about my family tree and all of those things that are in the past. And so it was a great lesson for me in the fact that the things that we found out about, the stories we've heard, the authors we've loved, the books we've fallen in love with, they matter just as much to our identity as anything else. Of course, the truth is, I'm not really, I'm definitely not Russian, unfortunately, but I'm not Polish either, because my great-great-grandfather, who came over uh, to Stockton on Tees in the north in 1861, he would never have spoken Polish. He would have spoken Yiddish, because we're Jewish. That was just something that passed out of my family in the way when anybody becomes a successful immigrant, they forget who they were. So my great-great-grandfather came here as Gershon, and soon became George. And yet the word Jewish was never spoken throughout the whole of my childhood. Um, but I'm thankful to that now, because so it allowed me uh, to pretend to be Russian, which has brought a lot of joy into my life. Uh, so I asked a friend who speaks Yiddish, what does this name Gros Groskop mean? And he said, well, obviously it's Yiddish, and Yiddish has a lot of similarities to German, so it means big head. <laughs> and I said, but in Shtetl, where our people came from, in Łódź, in Poland, what would it have meant, these people? Who would they be? And he said, well, Groskop, yes, it could be uh, the people in the village with the big brains, you know, the first people to learn to read, perhaps the first to accumulate a library in, in their home. Uh, and then I showed him a picture of me and my sister, and he said, oh, no, in your case, it's his fat head. <laughs> <laughs> The great thing though, the best thing of all, is that when I went to look at the documents uh, which showed uh, what my great-great-grandfather had said when he came to this country on the census, every 10 years you'd have to say where you're from and where you're born and where your people are from. But he, he sometimes says Prussia and he sometimes says Russia because the part of Poland that he came from would have been under Russian control. So maybe the fat head is a bit Russian after all. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>